The further you go back in traditions, it gives human beings enough time to really experience those interactions with the time and the emotions together. The native peoples have been there long enough to really understand the area. And colonial people, Anglo-Europeans, have not a clue. They have no notion of what they're going into. And actually, uh, this is one of the reasons I look at different Masonic names, because there's a tradition of naming the geographic locations with names that are a little bit deeper, like Fayette or Mason. Macon, I grew up in Macon County, Illinois. That's a Masonic name. That's at a different level of harmony and ritualized sort of naming that most Americans are not even thinking about. That's why you have to look at the names in an area, try to really look at their origins, and then even below that, historically, what's the native names of that area? And that's why I think most people that go into an area and all of a sudden they have a Bigfoot encounter or they have a, a, you know, a disappearance or whatever it may be, it becomes fearful to them after it happens, but not necessarily before they go into the area because most Americans nowadays are not working at a concrete level of interaction with the landscape. to eat in the car. We've had some we've had some luck with uh, food on this this trip. You've huh? done you've done really well finding the, the, the local local flavor. It's been really good. Why don't you tell why don't you tell everyone at home about your philosophy My on philosophy. finding places to eat. Go go for the uh, middling reviews with lots of comments because then uh, you can find a place where you eat out of a plastic bag like I'm doing right now. <laughs> Actually, I thought, as we saw it, I, I thought it was actually a, um, an optical illusion because it was you know, warm and there was a density difference in the air, and you see a pyramid that looks like it's on, um, just, just hovering in the sky. But actually, as you continue to go forward, you can tell it's the lake right in front of this grouping of mountains, and they're all shaped pyramidic, like pyramids. How about that? They're all shaped like pyramids. and. Um, it's very clear why it's called Pyramid Lake. Although I am curious to find out what the natives called it. You know, this is a, a war-torn area. Yeah. Uh, there's definitely a lot of history here. Uh, it goes back uh, into the not-too-distant past, and, and war is stretching back possibly even further than that. If if, uh, if the legends are to be believed, uh, the, the tribes of uh, Mount Shasta were making their way east uh, as far as far as Ohio, apparently, 
uh, but some sort of major battle in this area uh, uh, over towards Lovelock Caves, which is about, you know, 100, 100 200 miles from here. Let's there's, go. A, there's a museum over there. Let's go. Silver here. You think so? Silver star, right? Yeah. What do you got? Well, this land was rich in silver. That's why. That's why the Europeans were coming here was to mine for silver. So all the connections with the color silver, the metal silver. Where are you going with this? I don't know. I don't know. I'm just trying to think. Think it. Museum uh, here at Pyramid Lake, and I was taking a look at the uh, monument here, dedicating when the when the structure was erected. It has a date AD 1998, but right underneath it has a date AL um, 5998 or 5998, which is a difference of 4,000 years. And the AL actually refers to Analusis, which is a dating system that the Masons use. The AL Analusis refers to um, Year of Light, and it. It, it's tied to the old Hebrew texts that dates the year of creation, the time of creation, 4,000 years B.C. And Eleusis, let there be light, and you know, God created everything uh, out of the darkness. So that was really neat to see. Beside this large deposit of tufa rock, which we've learned is actually calcium carbonate, not unlike um, calcium carbonate limestone uh, and also coral is made out of. Um, it, we've also we have learned that this entire area was filled with much more water 20, 10, 10, 20,000 years ago, and that these um, deposits of tufa were either on the bottom of the lake bed or they were on the shoreline, anywhere where the water wasn't moving. Calcium carbonate would come up from the bottom, mixed with the other uh, other water from from the top, and, and make these deposits and drop the um, uh, drop the stone into, into those areas that didn't move around too much, non-turbulent areas. Easy to carve? Maybe. Do you let your imagination run wild around here, and, and you look? You, you, I, I, you can see uh, analogs to the, the hilltop forts that you find in West Virginia, that you find just west of here uh, in San Francisco, the East Bay Walls. Um, you, you get this sense that, yeah, is there a possibility of this this grand antediluvian uh, empire that, that stretched up and down the the, uh, the West Coast? Was this like the the, uh, the rim of a, of a continent that, that just that slipped away into the, uh, into, into the Pacific half a million years ago? 
Possibly, small chance, I don't know. Um, I, uh, what I do know is that uh, if, if, if I'm looking for prime real estate 30 or 40,000 years ago, I'll set up shop here. Uh, prime, prime beach side, uh, prime beach side little Tufa cottage behind me. Uh, Tufa Castle Grey Skull over that way. Um, I'm gonna get my uh, my buddies together, my uh, my nomadic buddies, and we're gonna carve some rock art over at Lake Winnemucca, where um, where where you find the oldest evidence of human habitation in North America. These these um, these amazing this amazing rock art. It's it's literally these giant carvings in the Tufa rock. Um, and, and we don't know how they did it. We don't know why they did it. Who knows? Were they protecting us by creating this rock art? Are these are these sigils somehow? Possibly. I'm just wildly speculating at this point. <laughs> Please, somebody stop me. Is it is it possible? Is it possible? Yeah, stay right there. Is it possible that our trip, in and of itself, has stemmed the apocalyptic catastrophe that was supposed to hit us this year? Are we those mystical workers that are actually out here saving the world? Do stories save the world? That's a question. Does context, do, does narrative context save the world? It's a good question. It, it, does this have to be recorded, for instance? Uh, are we recording right now? Is your finger we are, in we front are, of We are. We're recording. Front of the microphone. It's oh, a possibility. That's okay. Possible. That's okay. It might be a little muffled, but yes, when we weave stories, when we weave narratives, are we are we providing some sort of magical context for things that protect us? Is that is that how is that how planet Earth itself? Is that it's uh, are we the is, are we the white blood cells? Uh, the white blood cell count is uh, our human imagination. You know that protects us from uh, from from interference from outside. Again, just wildly speculating at the moment. Uh, uh, pass pass the hookah, uh, the peace pipe, whatever. There's cows out there, just chilling by the water. Cryptid cows? No, they look like normal cows. We need dogs. Yeah, we're gonna be talking about dogs. Dog star. I, just to follow up on that, I, I did catch a furry friend earlier. Um, uh, shout out to our associate, Ryan uh, Jackalope. Totally saw the, uh, the Jackalope. Researchers dispute the Paiute Indian legends regarding a cannibalistic warring tribe from the west, from the Mount Shasta area, uh, known as the Saitaka, so-called tool eaters. Uh, the giant cannibal tribes that would that would move east from Shasta uh, and and go to war with the Paiutes. There is some controversy over where some of the legends come from. However, uh, reading a creation myth regarding the Stone Mother, another stone formation off Pyramid Lake, uh, off from from the Paiute Indian website, uh, you 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 realize that uh, there is some basis in the Paiute legends uh, for for a Mount Shasta tribe. Essentially, the the father god uh, split up the the brothers and sisters of the original Paiute, and they he sent the the mean um, warring uh, siblings out west to the Pitt River area, just south of Mount Shasta, an area rich in tool. Uh, again, the Saituka, the so-called tool eaters. That was the name of the the tribe of the. The warring cannibals that would come uh, that would come east into Pyramid Lake and 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 further east into the Humboldt Basin, where they would have their last stand at Lovelock Cave. site back here of, of a major archaeological discovery uh, earlier in the 20th century, early 20th century. Uh, guano miners, though that's bat poop miners. Uh, <laughs> if, in case you didn't know, they were digging this whole area out. It's good and, money in that. Apparently so. Uh, uh, so they uh, they dug out quite a few artifacts um, from, from this area behind us. Uh, thousands of years this, this area um, inhabited. For what reason? Yeah, so... <laughs> 
for what reason? That I don't know. But the, uh, what, we, what we do know uh, through some of the research that we've been looking into is that this area, and, and I'm sure we'll show you some of the, the surrounding uh, depressed areas, was a 10,000 square mile lake called Lake uh, Lahontan. And if I do my math right, 10,000 square miles is huge. And in fact, it's the same lake that we uh, were visiting at Pyramid Lake and Lake Winnemucca. So that was all the same body of water uh, about 17,000 years ago. There were different times uh, throughout from then till now where uh, this was still had a, a significant amount of water. That's why there were a lot of peoples that were living here. It was very, uh, very fertile. Uh, it was easy to get food here. Uh, people used to store their, um, the natives people used to store their supplies and food up in Lovelock Cave. And they would be rather nomadic around the area, but uh, keep their, their food and supplies up, up in the cave, which is why that was host to so many uh, different uh, artifacts. It was such a rich um, ar archaeological site. Right, right. And, and among the archaeological artifacts that were discovered, uh, the, the most controversial, uh, controversial were these six to eight foot uh, tall uh, giants uh, with, with crops of red hair. Uh, and 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 the the whole controversy surrounding the Smithsonian that would go into you know like like various mounds excavate and and basically cart all those artifacts away the you know uh, uh, body parts included and uh, the skeletons however were recovered or, or at least parts of them and uh, a private collector in Winnemucca uh, held on to them for a number of years these giants which which are re recurring uh, throughout the the mound cultures of uh, North America, if we, if we can take these accounts seriously, uh, who or what or where are they coming from? And, and why would we find them in, in, in a place like this? Uh, th there are stories from the Native Americans, folklore, legends of, of, of battles with, with, a, with, a, with a, uh, an eastward expanding tribe uh, from Mount Shasta, a cannibalistic tribe of giants. Uh, in the local folklore around Shasta, or, or at least uh, along the West Coast, you read of, of rock giants. Um, lots, of, lots of skeletons found in caves, but the, the local Native Americans did not bury in caves. That was not a tradition of theirs. So, um, so, so, so why, why are we finding these bodies in there? The, the, the explanation, according to some of these Native Americans, these are, uh, these are the victims of these rock giants. Um, so, so these bodies were found buried, I guess, dense packed in guano. Uh, <laughs> so I, I don't know. I, I have no but idea. I think the, the other thing that it should be noted is that because this site has been around for thousands and thousands of years, you have different people and different uh, civilizations living on top of other people, right? So you've got layer upon layer of, of different peoples living here. Uh, I'm sure ever, people were battling for this, for this location. Uh, one tribe moved in, uh, another tribe was, uh, was eliminated. So I, I think there was just this constant churn of, of different people trying to live in this area. But just to step for a moment in crazy territory <laughs> and, and just, uh, just speculate, uh, the, the local uh, the local natives uh, the local stories um, in in weird America uh, mention uh, petrified sites uh, petrified remains of giants 25 miles away from here you'll, you'll find pyramidal structures that are attributed to this race of giants uh, again moving moving eastward from Shasta conquering as far as far east as Ohio where, where it, it is claimed that they were turned back were they were they responsible for the mountain culture mount culture were they were they somehow involved in that in, in in spreading or disseminating knowledge that contributed to these the formation of these things uh, I it's impossible to tell um, back to the Tufa rock example you see a lot of uh, uh, you see, you see what might be considered rock art behind us. I see, I see shapes and things like that. Am I, am I, am I looking too much into it? Possibly, but it's a very distinct uh, cave back here. I mean, it's uh, when you see it from the road, it stands right out. In fact, the highway's right over there. I wonder what this looks like from, you know, yeah, from over there. But um, it was a long, tortuous path coming in here, uh, about 10, 15 miles on the dirt road. It took a good 45 minutes just to get out here. Uh, so, it, and, and there's, there's nobody else out here but us for 
miles. You can tell we're New England boys. 10 to 15 miles on a, on a, on a gravel road <laughs> is, a, is a stretch. It's a long one. So we're gonna we're gonna dig around back there. Maybe we'll find some some nuggets of guano ourselves. Oh, and uh, and one can, can only hope. We can run into one of the local casinos and uh, and yeah yeah. Turn in that brown gold. Turn it <laughs> turn that brown gold into gold gold. Uh, it all ends right back up, sort of Raiders of the Lock Raiders of the Lost Ark style, cataloged at the Smithsonian. Uh, what was the Smithsonian doing? Just sort of covering the tracks of whatever culture uh, put in these mounds. I mean, was it, was it, was it, was it more damned data uh, that just couldn't easily have been accounted for? Uh, did, it, did it bolster Mormon beliefs? Uh, and, and was that a uh, danger to the, you know, the fealty of the United States at the time? I, any thoughts? No. No. None. We're out. Guano. Spicy guano? Spicy, a little habanero. Little, habanero guano. Little chili lime. A little bit. <laughs> so we're here, uh, this is, we're inside. We're inside La Block Cave right now. This is actually a very special moment for me. I think this is like our reward for starting this series because big dark cave, middle of nowhere, magical giants, cosmic battles. It all, it all comes together here. I mean, whether or not it's true, I don't know if you know this about me. I don't care. I, I don't care. It's it's just that these things come together. All the threads come together. It gets pulled together. I'm getting I'm getting this cold breeze in the back of my neck and my head. My literally the hairs are standing up right now because uh, this is it for me. I mean this is this is what I love, uh, and I know this is what Kyle loves. I mean this this is it, it's it's people's beliefs, their hopes. Lots happened here. There was agriculture here. There was there was. There, there, community here but then there are there are the surrounding stories and you, you have to ask well why the surrounding stories even if they weren't true what what inspired people to tell those stories why eight foot tall giants with with fangs found buried under bat poop in a cave why thousands of years old 10,000 square mile uh, inland sea behind us and these these uh, tufa rock formations surrounding it with these gorgeous this gorgeous petroglyph rock art this is why we're here, and this is why everybody should get out to these sites and create new sites and new stories, because it, it's a possibility that that's what's saving the world, that's what's holding the world together, are those stories. Those are the, those are, those are the things that influence us to do things, to get out of bed in the morning, to, to, to kiss each other at night, to sleep, because, because we have our own stories, our personal stories, we have our communal stories, we have our, national, our nationalistic stories, which may drive us to war, these big fascistic stories that are evil, and drive us to kill one another. But then we have personal stories that make us love one another and come together. And it's, it's all built on imagination. What is imagination but picturing something that may ne not necessarily be there. It may be there, it's behind the rock. You have to imagine what's behind the rock or behind the wall. And maybe all of that together, maybe that's, maybe that's Earth's immune response to, to the rest, to every celestial threat that's out there. Internal threats in included.
went into the fields of anthropology, zoology, and psychiatric social work, not because I needed to learn those skills, but I already had a leaning towards them. And being in cryptozoology, going around interviewing people, working in the mental health field at the same time because I felt that I was good at it and turned out I was, helped me more and more. Because what occurs, of course, is that you home your skills. You became sharper. Uh, I became sharper. And uh, the world view that I brought in almost immediately was that anthropologically, the person that I was talking to, their worldview was just as valid as mine. I did not want to let my belief systems, my theories, whatever, get in the way of the data. I wanted to listen to people clearly. I very quickly understood that there were some mental health issues, that there was some isolation issues, that there were some uh, social issues. All of these were involved into the different stories. But in addition to that, there was just some people that were trying to make a connection with someone that actually accepted them for what they said they were. An eyewitness to a, an unusual happening, uh, a, a strange creature, um, a, a rocky area that made them feel spooky. So I didn't put my own sort of fog across it. I just tried to let it through. My mentor was Ivan T. Sanderson, and he said, never explain one unknown with another unknown. It really gets in the way of just making yourself open to the data. And that's been my sort of watchwords. Uh, and I'm very careful about that.